Okay, so at the end of our last presentation, we had pointed out that we have the domain or super kingdom, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, and it is the genus and species system that we are most familiar with. Now, I'm going to take a look at into all of this. Actually, we're just going to look at Homo sapiens um, or man. And if you look at this chart, then we fall under the uh, domain of eukarya. That is all eukaryotic organisms. Those are organisms whose cells have nuclei. And within that, we fit into the kingdom animalia, as opposed to plantae or the other choices. Um, we are the phylum chordata, because we have a spinal cord. Uh, the class is mammalia, because we are warm-blooded and feed uh, baby's breast milk. We are of the order primates in that we have um, basically hand-like structures like uh, raccoons um, and great apes. The family Homididae, um, we have the genus Homo, which is uh, like Homo erectus, Homo habilis, um, and then we are uh, species of sapiens. Now, humans are kind of unique in that other organisms have um, a genus and they may have several subspecies. Uh, Homo uh, only has at this time the species sapiens. Um, the uh, Neanderthal man, uh, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, uh, those have died out. So we are somewhat unique in that characteristic. If we go with this binomial naming system, there are some conventions on how we would write this. First off, the genus is capitalized and it's italicized. So if we're talking about uh, Streptococcus, it would look like this. Now, then we have the species and it's in lowercase, but it is also italicized like that. And then we have uh, abbreviations, which we often use, in which case we use the first letter capitalized with a period after it, uh, genus, and then we have the species name. So we could say instead of Streptococcus lactus, we could just say S. lactus. Common names are still used by laypersons. Um, uh, a cat is still Felinus domesticus. So those still exist. But uh, you should know how these are written. Um, there will be no doubt a question on the test uh, asking you to identify what is the proper way to write some genus species name. Um, how these names get applied, well, it has a little bit to do with the shape of the organism. It has a little bit to do with what the organism does, uh, location it's found, and so forth. So if you look at this table, you see Streptococcus lactus. It's a chain of spheres, so all chains of spheres are streptococci. This produces lactic acid. Escherichia coli, that is a bacillus, and it is found in the colon, thus the coli. Uh, Treponina pallidum. Um, it is a twisting, turning, spiral type organism, and it's pale, thus the pallidum. You know, we've got uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Staph are grape-like cr uh, clusters of spheres, and they form a gold pigment, and uh, aureus means gold. We have Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a sugar fungus, and Cerevisiae at the means beer so it ferments beer so you get kind of an idea of how these are named we've been talking about these microorganisms and i mentioned very early on that if you just took a pinch of dirt between your fingers there would be about a billion microorganisms so that's uh it's maybe a little hard to get a grasp on we're going to talk about the measurement what we use for microbial measurements are microns and nanometers. These are measurements um, often too small for the light microscope. Uh, we're talking about viruses. When we start talking about nanometers, we're talking about viruses that are 25 nanometers. To give you an idea of what a nanometer is, um, traveling at the speed of light, 
you could go around the Earth four times in one second. In a nanosecond, you would travel one foot as opposed to a nanometer compared to a meter. An idea. Um, we are talking about things that are extremely small. Um, in fact, if you look at this particular chart, you can see that in the kind of blue-green, we are looking at things that are only visible with an electron microscope. So there are some very small bacteria that cannot even be seen with a light microscope. Certainly HIV, polio virus, DNA, those require an electron microscope to see. Um, most of the microorganisms that we deal with, we can see with a light microscope. Um, some of them are even large enough that we can see with the naked eye. <clears throat> um, just another perspective on scale. Uh, we are going to discuss mostly organisms that are visible in the light microscope, but a bacteria, which is something that is easily visible with a light microscope, is... Um, if you were to take a single bacterium on me, it would compare pretty much to a fly as relates to the Empire State Building. So these are still remarkably small, small uh, organisms. Now, the microscope, mi microscopy, uh, I know we talked about von Leeuwenhoek, who was able to use his microscope to draw for the first time and describe small microorganisms, but the fact is stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, he made a functional, usable microscope that allowed him to do this. However, prior to that, we had, uh, as early as 1267, magnifying glasses, uh, then we had regular reading glasses or glasses uh, in the 1300s. Um, there was even a crude microscope by the early 1600s, and by 1620, Galileo had perfected uh, a microscope of sorts. So von Leeuwenhoek got one, uh, made a microscope that worked very well, but there were some predecessors to that. Now, the light microscope... Um, is referred to as a compound microscope, the ones that we use in uh, science classes all over the place. And they're called a compound microscope because they have two lenses. Uh, they have an ocular lens, which is the eyepiece, and an objective lens, which is facing whatever sample you have. And it is a combination of the actions of these two lenses that give us our magnification. Underneath the lens, there's some form of uh, condenser that will help focus the light. And the total magnification we get is the ocular times the objective. So typically, an ocular, ocular is 10x. Uh, an objective can be anywhere from 4x to 100x. Uh, and so 10 times 100, you could get a magnification up to 1,000. Um, there are limits to the kind of magnification you can get. Just because uh, light refracts through glass, uh, which is on the slide or other structures, we can put oil in there, which will limit the refraction, but we still can't see fine detail because um, there are structures smaller than the wavelength of visible light. Now, other types of microscopy which do help um, as you see here, this is through a light microscope, but you can use dark field microscopy, and it doesn't require uh, anything too special. Uh, there's a filter that can be put on a light microscope, which will give you a dark field and will shoot light through the microorganism. Uh, as a result, you can visualize some structures that you might not be able to see here. There's also fluorescence microscopy and uh, electron microscopy. The disadvantage with both fluorescence and electron microscopy is that the sample has to be dead. You, know, you can't see the activity of some of the structures in those. Um, the electron microscope, there are two types, the scanning and the transmission microscope. Now, you can get really, really fine detail 
with these. Uh, we said that a magnification of a thousand with a light microscope, but with a transmission electron microscope, you can have a magnification of 20 million. And with a scanning electron microscope, up to 100,000. And below, you see this image and this image, and these are from transmission electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes. So we have the uh, scanning electron here, uh, transmission microscope here and you get some very very sharp sharp details the scanning electron microscope is actually going to give you kind of a three-dimensional view um, the transmission you can see structures that lie within the cell so that concludes the materials for chapter two and the key points that you need to be aware of have been hit on this presentation. However, it would not hurt to go through and read and understand the materials and the text. Uh, if there's anything in the presentations that you're unsure of, please look at those uh, textbook materials again and look at the adjunctives that are posted on the side uh, of the, of the um, soft chalk lesson. As always, learn and understand the key terms, in this case on page 42 of your text, and you should be able to define all of those terms and name the accomplishments of the scientists who were involved in developing taxonomy. Um, that is everything. Uh, I hope this has been helpful, and thank you very much.